Let us pray. God Almighty, Heavenly Father, King of all creation, we thank and praise you for your divine, inspired, inerrant word, the rule and norm for faith and life. Through your spirit, open our minds and hearts to receive the proclaimed word that we are about to hear. Grant that it would be faithful and it would be fruitful. Grant that we would learn and we would understand and we would grow. Grant that by your spirit we would be moved to greater heights of your love shown toward you and toward our neighbor. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father. From our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the text for the sermon today is the epistle lesson you heard, Jude, verses 20 to 25, and you'll notice um, there's no chapter there. It's because Jude is too short for there to be chapters. There are only verses. So it's Jude, verses 20 to 25, and we're going to home in on uh, verses 22 and 23, and the title is, Why I Love My Church. So, Why do I love my church? I love my church, for example, because a few weeks ago, some of the ladies of the church decided they didn't want families in need to go without a Thanksgiving dinner, and so they got together and started to put together Thanksgiving gift baskets. And the congregation donated food, and more food, and more food, and filled these baskets. And why do I love my church? Because we went to Davie Elementary and found 10 families there that needed baskets. And so not only did the congregation chipped in, but the school chipped in in Mrs. Harbour's class. Some of the other kids put together boxes. And there's little hand prints on the boxes that the kids put on their little hand turkeys and a prayer. Very nice. Nicely done. A Thanksgiving prayer was sent over to the school as well. Why do I love my church? Uh, Because we needed grocery gift cards uh, to go in those baskets so they'd have, uh, you know, take a whack at getting a turkey as well as having all the fixings in there. And when we were a little short on gift cards, we made an appeal and you came forward. In fact, one family came forward and said, here, we'll donate 10. Donated 10 $25 gift cards to put in these baskets for total strangers. Why do I love this church? I love this church because when it came time to help out some brand new Christians in Haiti, we got together and raised $5,800 to build a church for them. And I want you to know that the foundation has been laid, and we have a picture of it that was sent to us. If we can put that up there. This is the foundation for Gloria Day Lutheran Church in Cayon, Haiti, and the building will be under construction very shortly uh, so that that church will be there. Why do I love this church? I love this church because when that pastor in Haiti needed basic transportation to get to and from his home and to take the gospel to outlying villages, a family stepped forward and said, here, get him a motorcycle. Why do I love this church? I love this church because when people are hurting and when they're in need and when the chips are down and life is kicking them in the dirt, this family of God stands up, rises to the occasion, steps up to bat and knocks it out of the park. And not just once or twice, but with consistency. Every time there's an appeal, this family rises to the occasion. Why do I love this church? Because even though you don't know it, this church uh, tonight provided a way for tonight a family is going to go home and have a roof over their head because the church dug deep and found a way to make up two or three payments and even interceded on behalf of the family uh, so that the family could keep their house. Why do I love this church? Because tonight more than one family will reach for a light switch and will have power because this church kept their power on. Why do I love this church? Because when a widow came to us in the community, you don't know this, but she wasn't going to be able to drive anymore because she was going to not be able to pay for insurance and she couldn't get her food and couldn't go to the pharmacy and get her medication. So even though she's not a member, the church rose to the occasion and paid for six months of car insurance so she can work with her family to find somebody to help her out. Why do I love this church? Because it's real. This is no country club. This is not some shallow, insipid place where people gather to be affirmed, where people can nod at their jokes and revel in similar politics and 
bask in people who are just like them. This is the people of God, planted firmly in this place by God, to do ministry in his holy name, to be the eyes, the ears, the hands, the feet of Jesus Christ, gospeling others and caring for their needs in the best way we know how. Now, you don't hear a lot of this because we don't brag, we don't toot our horn, we don't run multi-million dollar ad campaigns on TV, we don't send you $10,000 flyers uh, that uh, show you a child with a handful of rice and beg for money. We don't do that because we're the church. We're only doing what we're supposed to do, but you know what? In the name of better communication, as a great man once told me, we only see the tip of the iceberg. In the name of communication, you need to know this is what your church is doing because we're family and because you're making these things happen. Right here in Davie, you're doing this through your giving. Now, we've spent two years working very hard together, you and I. We're getting theology all squared away, preaching and teaching and really going after this thing. And we're turning a corner. I can feel it. I can sense it. I've got more confidence today than I've ever had in a parish, a good and better feeling about this place than I've ever had before. And we're ready now to go to the next level. And the only way to do that is to crank it up and dig deeper into the Bible and deeper into the texts and learn and to grow. And we're starting today by going to the next level of Christian living. We're going to talk about giving and gospeling in our community. Now, this first part is a touchy subject. Nobody likes to talk about giving. No pastor likes to give up and say anything about giving. And visitors don't want to hear it because the world always says, ah, those churches... They're just after my wallet. Well, A, that's silly. B, that's a pretty lame excuse to not go to church. Be quiet. Get in here. You need this place. You can quote me on that. It's a joke, people. I know we're Lutheran, but wow. But we're going to talk about, and it's kind of touchy. I don't want you to read into this any subtexts that aren't there between the lines. I'll just tell you exactly what I'm saying, but feel free to ask questions later, obviously, because I'm not perfect. I'm I might say something that doesn't make sense or whatever. That's okay. We can clear that up. I want to talk about giving in a very special context. It's the, the, the holiday season. You can see all around we're decorating. And I know you're already getting appeals from national organizations. I know this because I'm getting appeals. from. How do they know where I live? From national organizations. I'm getting them from American Bible Society. I'm getting them from St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. I'm getting them from... Oh man, you name it. And the good ones, the really good ones that have like hired official high dollar marketing people and psychologists, they're sending me pre-printed labels. It's emotional extortion. They send me the labels. It costs them 0.37 cents to print 20 labels, right? But I get them and I go, oh, they spent money on this. I better write them a check. And I send them 20, 10 or $20. Emotional extortion. They're good. Now, this doesn't mean that they're bad organizations. Of course, they're not bad organizations. They're doing a lot of good things. But I want to point something out. Your church needs you. Your church needs you. That ministry stuff I was talking about, that happens all the time. I'm just giving you a few examples. People come in here all the time needing help. And the only way we can help them is through you through your giving to this church. We can only do as much ministry as we as a family, okay, take care of through our giving. And there's all kinds of ministry going on here. We have a school across the way. What happens when little Johnny or little Mary comes in in tears because there's been another fight in the house and they're afraid? A loving Christian teacher drops everything and ministers. To little Johnny or Mary. And little, when little Edward, I'm just making up names, pulling out a thing. When little Edward comes in without breakfast, a teacher makes sure little Edward has breakfast and sometimes out of her own pocket. And parents stop teachers and stop administrators and stop staff members. And they need advice on lives that sometimes are in wreckage. And all of that happens 
right here. You're making this possible with your giving, and your church needs you. It needs you because we don't ever want to reach the point where somebody comes in in pain and suffering, and we have to turn them away from a church because we don't have the resources to do ministry here. And I'm going to tell you or suggest to you how we can address this. And in doing this, I want to be very clear. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm never going to do that. Okay? With Scripture, I'm going to tell you what's right, and the rest is between you and God. With living a Christian life, I'm going to give you suggestions, and the rest is between you and God. Here's what I want to talk about today. A lot of us give to national nonprofit organizations, and they do good work. But I want to point out to you, you may never have thought about this, every dollar you send out of Davy to some national organization is a dollar your church doesn't have ministry to use, to do with, okay? We can't, that dollar's gone. It's out of Davy. It's somewhere else, okay? And when you put together kind of an aggregate or cumulative, cumulative number, cumulative amount of money sent out of Davy, those thousands and thousands of dollars aren't doing ministry here because they're going somewhere else. I'm not telling you where to give. I'm not saying they're bad organizations. Don't misread this. I'm just pointing out simple math. Money sent out of Davy somewhere else does not do ministry through your church. Here, I'll give you an example. Uh, I send, let's say I send uh, 20 or $50 to American Bible Society. Good cause. It's going to put Bibles in people's hands in Africa or China somewhere. What it won't do is put Bibles in the hands of the Vietnamese students right here at Gloria Dei, who are in the second story annex right outside this sanctuary, learning English as a second language now every week. And that school is expanding from one classroom to a second, and they've got dibs on a third, and they have a nearby campus over by Broward College with 120 students. So all of the Bible-ish money we send away to national and international organizations is great but doesn't help your local church put Bibles in the hands of the people right here on our very grounds. That's just an example. And I also want to point out to you that while all of these organizations are really good organizations and they're doing very necessary work, I want to point out to you that your church is a good organization doing very necessary work. And there's a big difference between your church and those national and international organizations. They're not bad organizations. They're great. But there's still a big difference. Here's one. When the chips are down in your life, and when you're sick, or something goes wrong with a misbehaving child that gets in trouble, or a problem with a job or a marriage, your church will be there for you. You can pick up the phone and let us know somebody is going to respond to that phone call, to that notification that there's trouble or a problem or a need. Somebody will come. We're not perfect, okay? And we don't read minds. We don't know there's trouble until you tell us. We don't know where you are until you tell us. But somebody's going to care about that and respond. Which national organization is going to do that for you? Who's going to send somebody out to hold your hand while you're sick or to listen to your pain? Your local church is going to do that. And there's a big difference also in the way that money is used that you donate between your local church and big national organizations. Now, I happen to know this from personal experience because way back, um, 1990, 1991, somewhere in there, okay, so about 20 years ago, one of my first jobs was uh, to be a lackey in the print shop in the United Way building in Atlanta, Georgia, which was a regional center for national nonprofits. The United Way building is a 19-story glass and steel structure in the financial district. It's gorgeous. And it was a pretty killer job, you know, for minimum wage. And I met all of these people and dealt with executives, regional executives, and that's how I know that they're paid really well. Okay? And the justification for that is, and I understand, is that we need good executives to run these operations, and to be competitive, we have to pay salaries equivalent to for-profit corporations. So some of these regional, not national, but regional people are making six-figure salaries paid by your donations. Okay? I knew a guy 
1990-1991, making nearly $250,000 to run a regional office of a nonprofit. Most of the other executives were in six figures also. Okay? And there was even a hierarchy based on the size of the nonprofit, and they knew who to apply for next. You rise into management here and you go there, and all of the players were there Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boys and Girls Clubs of America, American Cancer Society, Red Cross, Habitat for Humanity, da 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 da. Okay, they're all there. They're renting office space in this 19 story glass and steel structure. And the executives, most of them, are making six-figure salaries 20 years ago. That's not a value statement about them. They have a right to run a great nonprofit, and those executives have a right to a decent wage. I'm not saying any of that. What I am saying to you is, is right here at your church, the professional staff is working at half or less than what they could walk out there in the world and go make. And we don't rent anything here because we've been good stewards of this land. We own this land and these buildings, and there's no mortgage and there's no rent. We just have maintenance. Which means that dollar for dollar, if you want to help somebody, you cannot beat giving to your local church. Because the percentage of every dollar that goes to administrative costs, including rent and so forth, is much, much higher anywhere else other than your local church, and that's on top of realizing that, again, every dollar you send out is not a dollar in service here, okay, among this community, does not support your local church. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm giving you information. I think it's very important information, okay? It's important information because we have a mission here. We belong here here. We're from this Davy area. Our brothers and sisters who live around us who don't yet know Jesus are depending on us, and God is depending on us. God is not out on the corner, uh, not out on the corner handing out money to people in need. He isn't showing up in living or showing up at FPL and paying the power bill, okay? He's trusting you and me to do that here, okay? So this work is absolutely critical. So I want to give you a little challenge here in the holiday season, in the midst of all these appeals from big national nonprofits. Now that you know what you know, the challenge is, I'd like you to consider what you're going to give to this, your, your church in the coming year. And if you have a reason, okay, it's getting toward the end of the calendar year, if you have a reason to need more of a tax break, depending on your burden, please look here because we have families right now who we can help. Some of them might be sitting within easy reach of you right here in Davie. This is your church. This is our family. This is our mission. Please, as a challenge, consider your giving to your church and the ministry here next year. Second part of the challenge, I said it was giving and gospeling. Let's go to the reading for today, Jude verses 22 and 23, because I want to show you something really interesting. This is going to help with your gospeling. Verse 22 says, And have mercy on those who doubt, verse 30, uh, 23, save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now, These are three different groups of people, and this is a big deal with gospeling. Let's go back to verse 22. Here's the first group. And have mercy on those who doubt. Now, you've had the experience by now of gospeling somebody and having them not be really sure. You probably also have Christian friends or people who are kind of sort of coming along, but they're weak in the faith. And they don't know about this church thing. And they don't know where they should belong or what they should do. This first group of people, these are people that you need to be gentle with, you need to be tender with, you need to be listening to them. You need to watch and listen, watch their responses and hear what they're saying and really listen to them to make sure you're not applying too much pressure, okay? Because it is possible to run away a person immature or weak in the faith, run them away where they won't listen anymore. Now, I'm not talking, talking about enabling error, 
false teaching or bad behavior. Uh Uh-uh, no way. And that's a mistake we also make. So we got got two extremes. One extreme is we're too legalistic and we run people away. The other extreme is we're antinomian, which means we kind of throw out the law in favor of the gospel. We don't want to tell them the truth because they might not like us or they might might leave. First, our job is not to be liked. Our job is to be truthful. So with gentleness and respect, we still hold to the truth and the doctrine that's sound, contend once for all for the faith delivered right, by the saints. That's also from Jude. You can't contend for the faith unless doctrine is objective and knowable, and the Bible consistently says that it is, that the truth can be known and must be held to. Okay? But with gentleness and respect, we want to do this. A big mistake we make in the church today is to toss out truth, in favor of watering down and creating a syrupy, sappy, welcoming, because we think that'll attract more people kind of an experience. That's not what saves. What saves is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is both law and gospel. Okay, the word of God is law and gospel. The law shows us our sin, tells us the punishment is death, and tells us we need to repent. The gospel says you are forgiven all of this in Jesus Christ by grace through faith. That's awesome good news. And it's yours to give away freely. So again, the first group here, verse 22, be tender, be gentle, do not be enabling, but be tender and be gentle and be consistent. Second group, verse 23, save others by snatching them out of the fire. Okay, clearly we've moved to another group. These people are in serious danger. Now, if you had a toddler walking up to a fire, you wouldn't be all mousy and hang back, oh, honey, really? You know, what's that? You know, I smell something. You wouldn't wait until the toddler's in the fire burning up, then to take action. What you do is you snatch him out of the fire. Grab. Now, the toddler's going to respond negatively to this, probably, with a scream and a yell and, ah, you scared me, or whatever, right? Okay. Or, or maybe, like some children do, right? You know, you tell them, uh, stay away from this hot stove, lay out on the floor and kick their feet. You don't love me! Okay? You know what? Adults do the same thing. When faced with the law, adults revert back to childhood and say, you don't love me, right? When we tell them the error of their ways or warn them from behaviors that are damaging, you don't love me. Don't live together, it's bad for you. You don't love me, right? Don't do drugs, you don't love me, okay? You have to be able to recognize the false call of you don't love me and not fall for it. It's not loving to let people damage themselves. It is loving to snatch them out of the fire. And here's your biblical mandate, one of many. Okay? Now, there are two uh, subcategories of this group of people. There's a broad sense and there's a narrow sense. The broad sense is we must regard everybody we meet as a stick that needs to be snatched out of the fire. So everybody you meet, perfect strangers... Okay? Until you know better, until you know they're believers, we have to regard them as burning sticks to be snatched, rescued out of the fire. That's a big challenge. You know, that's the, the, the checkout person at the grocery store. That's the waiter or waitress where you eat. This person, that person, whoever you bump into. Okay? And a lot of people don't want to do that. They say, well, I, I'm scared, or uh, I don't know what to say, or I don't want them to think I'm one of those kind of people. Now imagine how that's going to play on Judgment Day. Sorry, Lord, all those people in the fire over there, I didn't want them to think I was that kind of person. Ding. That's not going to work. Okay? Our job is not to be liked again. Our job is to be truthful. Our job is to snatch them out of the fire. So gospel that checkout person, gospel that waiter or waitress, gospel the gas station attendant. Hey, it might be your only shot. And you might be, you don't know on that day that you might be the last person they hear from before it's their time. Snatch them like a burning stick out of the fire. That's the broad category and the narrow category is the friend, is the family member, is the fellow believer engaging in a lifestyle that's super dangerous and is going to burn them, okay? Again, the church too often makes the mistake of playing nice. I don't want to get involved. I don't want them mad at me. You know, it's their life. Who am I to? Again, on Judgment Day, that's really going to play, right? Oh, it's their life. Who was I to? Right? 
Snatch them like a burning stick out of the fire. Call a sin a sin. Say, hey, this is bad for you. Don't enable the pain and the problems. Don't let them go down in flames when you were there and could have said something. Don't leave yourself in the position of second guessing later. Could I have made it? Yeah, you could have. Yeah, you could have. Well, they won't listen to me. It's not your job to make them listen. It's your job to speak. The listening part's up to them. Next group of people, after the semicolon there, to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. All right, this third group of people then, these are the folks that will not listen to you. No matter what you do, you are gospeling, 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 and now they're fed up and aggressive and they mock you and they don't want anything to do with you and they are barreling down the road toward destruction no matter what, probably engaging in all kinds of things uh, that's really gonna take them down. Okay, here's the thing. Still, even in the midst of them rejecting you and mocking you, show them mercy. However, don't get caught up in either enabling or participating in a lifestyle that's gonna take you down with them. There's an old Chinese proverb that I break out from time to time. It goes like this. People are like fish. You become like the water you swim in. So watch the water you swim in, especially young people. You're not going to save that friend by going into bad situations and participating in bad things, thinking that you've got some way to magically save them once you are there. Don't swim in that water. You'll get polluted with them. Show mercy for their predicament. Be honest about what's really hurting them. It's sin. And stay out of the bad stuff that's going to drag you down as well. And so we come, now that we know about these three groups, to the gospel challenge. There was a giving challenge, now there's a gospel challenge. It goes like this. The leadership over at RISE has come up with Project 313. First, just to remind everybody for the umpteenth time, RISE is our college church plant satellite over at NOVA. And it's run by 20 and 30-year-olds, mostly 20-year-olds. And they've come up with Project 313 on their own, And they've all agreed to it, and it works like this. Each week until 2013, that's the 13 part, each week they're going to invite every single one of them, they're going to invite three people to church each week until 2013. That's Project 313. Each week they're going to invite some perfect stranger, friend, doesn't matter. They're going to invite three people to church each week until 2013 and then reevaluate it and see how it's working out and if they want to tweak it. Okay? And that's the challenge I bring to you. I want you to think about this. Now, we have about 520 uh, regular, solid, active, actually here members. All right? There are more who aren't like always here, but there's 520 that are members. Even if we only invited one person a quarter, only one person every three months, we'd have over 2,000 visitors to this church next year. You see, it's not the pastor's job to grow the church. It's not the staff's job to grow the church. It's the church's job to grow the church. And if everybody only invited one person every three months, we'd have over 2,000 visitors here next year. And if only 10% of them stayed and became members, we'd have over 200 new members next year alone. Now, it's not about numbers. The numbers are just a metric to track ministry. That represents souls, real live human beings saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ and brought into the care of the church. That's a big deal. So, to recap, here's your giving challenge. Between now and the end of the year, I want you to consider your giving to your local church, this your local church, understanding that you can't do better with your money in terms of directly helping people. And that your church, which is here for you, needs you so the church can be here for others as well. You're doing actual real life ministry day after day after day, even when you don't even know it, through this church. Second, the gospel challenge. Project 313. Invite three people a week to church every week until 2013. Hey, it's Christmas around the corner. Everybody's thinking about church. They don't even know it and they're thinking about church. Invite them to church. You have an awesome church. Now, the reason for all of this, I'm not up here saying all of this because I like the sound of my voice, as strange as that may seem. I'm not saying all of this, okay, just to flap my jaws 
or kill off a half an hour or so. I'm saying this because I believe in you. I believe in you. More importantly, God believes in you. You're not here randomly. You got to know that. God has brought you to this place. He's brought you here to be the eyes, the ears, the hands, the feet of Jesus, sharing the love of God in Jesus Christ with hurting and broken people. And if we don't do it, nobody will. I believe in you. Why do I love this church? Because you're the real thing. And I know you're going to do it. I walked out here knowing that you guys are going to be on this, and this thing is going to happen. We're going to the next level. It's time, church. You know you're saved by grace through faith. The blood of Jesus Christ intercedes for you even now, and you're covered by his righteousness. By faith in him, you're forgiven, you're saved, you have eternal life. Now, filled with that joy and the certainty of the hope of the resurrection that is to come, it's time to rise up, church, and go giving and gospeling. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen.